Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you very much. And yes, on the coattails of Dr. Scott, we're going to transition and talking about some clinically relevant drug interactions. And I know whenever you see a title of drug interaction talk by a pharmacist, you're like, oh, okay, here's some visual ambient. I'm really going to mix it up today to make this sort of the, the take home for you and for your patients. So with that, I have nothing to disclose. And we are going to look at some basic pharmacokinetic principles to, to really, I think, just, you know, for the clinician level of understanding the complexity or appreciating the complexity of some of these interactions. And the application of this really comes in identifying important interactions that you may be facing with both the DAAs and your antiretrovirals, along with your non-antiretrovirals. And we're going to explore both of those and really, I think, have an application tool from this talk as well is what tools are out there that can help you because you may not have a pharmacist in your pocket like some programs do or some providers do. So how can you use these tools to modify treatment of either the hep C or the HIV to give you the, the best chance for patient outcomes? And so we have three cases to, I think, emphasize some of these points. And the first one is just a newly diagnosed 50-year-old male. His HIV is pan-sensitive, CD4 count 350, viral loads 50,000 copies. His hep serologies include a positive antibody for hep C, genotype 3, 4 million copies. Surface antibody positive for hep B, corn negative. His total antibody for A is positive as well. Kidney function tests are normal. Otherwise, labs indicate he does not have cirrhosis, most likely. So keeping this in mind and understanding that you want to treat the hepatitis C at some point in the next 6 to 12 months, what would you select for an antiretroviral regimen? Dalutegravir plus emtricitabine TDF, so Tivocate Truvada. Bictaf, FTC, or Bictarvi, Dalutegravir Lamivudine, or Divado, or Darunavir, Cobacistat, Emtricitabine, Taf, or Simtuza. Okay, and I think what's, again, interesting about this is what nobody picked, which is good, and that being the drugs that are no longer a preferred agent within the HHS guidelines on that preferred for majority of people with HIV, primarily because of interactions that are associated with that. So let's dive a, a little bit deeper. And this is a timeline of the DAAs that came to market. And for those of you that were around doing hep C 10 years ago, you remember the flurry, the anticipation that we had with these drugs. And telaprevir and bisepravir, which were our first two really kind of kicked the door wide open. But there are also huge pharmacokinetic problems with them. Telaprevir needed to be dosed every eight hours without missing a dose, needed to be dosed with 30 grams of fat, so there were significant nutritional and food drug interactions. And then there were also other kinetic interactions with metabolism. But as the dust has settled over time, We've really come to this two-horse race of Softvel or Epclusa and GP or Maverit, which John really highlighted last week. And, and these are the two that I'm really going to emphasize as I think a majority of insurance programs and providers have sort of moved these to the top. That's not to say that the other drugs don't have problems because they do, but these have, again, sort of migrated that way. So, when we look at, I think, some of the relevant variables of the pharmacokinetics of these two drugs, there's some things to think about. And, and first is when we talk about pharmacokinetics, we're really talking about four things. And that's the body's action on a drug. It's absorption. How does the drug get distributed? How does it get metabolized and excreted? And when we look at soft VEL, really at the level of absorption, VEL has a really unique characteristic where it needs a acidic environment to be dissolved and absorbed. And when we look at drug interactions with velpanosphere, it's drugs that increase the pH, such as our PPIs, our H2 antagonists, and to some degree, 
antacids. And when we look at the sofosbuvir portion of this, it's really unique in the context that sofosbuvir is actually a prodrug that once it gets distributed to the site of action, which is the hepatocytes, where it needs to act, it goes through the stepwise process to become activated. And so we need to make sure that there's the hepatic ability to get the drug into these cells where it's going to act. And both of these drugs have different metabolic pathways, and so we would expect different types of interactions. But one of the most common interactions that we see in the HIV world is with the cytochrome P450 system. And velpatosphere is a strong substrate for that. And drugs that interfere with that pathway may also interfere with the drug levels of velpatosphere. On the other hand, when we look at Maverit, there's really no significant issues with absorption, metabolism, even elimination. And to some degree, food will enhance and increase its absorption, giving you a little bit higher drug levels, but with high drug levels also come higher side effects. And the main drug that has the interactions in this realm is the glucoprevir. And that is a substrate for 3A4, keeping in mind that the main interactions come from that. But not to dwell deep on this slide, just to kind of orient you and give you, I think, some appreciation, is that on the left-hand side, when we look at absorption, there's lots of different ways and transporters that drugs go from the intestinal lumen into the bloodstream. And just because we interfere or inhibit one doesn't mean a drug can't migrate a different way. Same thing when we look at metabolism. And over here on the right-hand side, you can see that the cytochrome P450 plays a strong role in the metabolism of a lot of the direct acting antivirals. But not only that, we have different channels by which the drugs are metabolized. And the, the take-home message here is that the interactions can be complex. They are not always absolute. If you affect one pathway, drugs can sort of have a unique characteristic to be able to go through some other pathways for metabolism as well. All right, assuming I didn't lose anybody there, let's move over and talk about some interactions between HIV meds and the DAAs. And this is a 60-year-old who's well-controlled on a salvage regimen of darunavir cobacistat, so Priscobix plus Bictaf FTC, and needs to be treated for genotype 1, does not have cirrhosis. Which of the following would be the best treatment option for this patient? Would you use Maverick? or GP, or Epclusa, Softvel, or would you use something else? And if you're going to use something else, I'd like to know. So, all right, very interesting. Who chose something else, just out of curiosity? What did you choose? Maybe Harvoni. Okay, we'll check back in. So, we have a split. So, this is really interesting. So, let's take a look at why one might be better than the other. And... Again, for those of you who may not have a pharmacist handy, there are lots of interaction tools out there. There is, if you have access to UpToDate, that usually links out to Lexicomp and that has a pathway. But a simple web-based tool that is very reliable is the Liverpool database. There's one for HIV and Hep C. But what you can do is just click the interaction checker and it takes you to your, sort of your home page. You start by entering your hepatitis C drugs that you want to choose, along with any additional drugs that the patient may be on. And so let's start out by doing GP or Maverit, along with the patient's antiretrovirals of darunavir cobacistat plus BICTAF FTC. What we see is that it gives us the results of do not co-administer. And so understanding why is Again, part of the learning process, we're all learners. And if we dive a little bit deeper, you can just click on that and it will bring up a summary and a description of the interactions. And so when we look at this, its summary tells us that the co-administration of darunavir and cobacistat will increase the glucoprevir concentrations, you know, anywhere between five to eight fold. So when we think about that, that tells us that there's most likely going to be some sort of toxicity associated with glucoprevir. 
And then if you really wanted to get your nerd on, you can dive in, you can see, oh, okay, this is through the oat transporter, or it's through P-glycoprotein, or BR, BCRP. There's different ways of which the interactions happen. But if we take this and we put in saposphere velpetosphere, along with this patient's drug regimen for HIV, we can see that there's no significant drug interactions that are identified. And again, using this tool can help us navigate appropriate drug options. And seeing that approximately, and again, not everybody on, you know, does a lot of hep C, but this gives you that sort of peace of mind going into this. And if we look at a summary of these interactions and identify some of the relevant ones with GP, what we see is that both the favorins and etravirine which are known sort of inducers, they accelerate some of these enzymes in speeding up metabolism, they can drop the levels of GP. Whereas we saw from the case that boosted darunavir or adazanavir can increase those GP levels. In regards to sofosbuvir, really the only major interaction we have is topranavir and ritonavir. And since we don't use topranavir much, you know, or we've never used it much, that's less of a worry. And when we look at velpatosphere, it too may have some enzyme induction in lower levels if used with either efavirenz or etravirine. And not that we're using a lot of TDF, but sometimes the velpatosphere may increase TDF levels a little bit, and it may warrant monitoring kidney functions just a little closer. All right, now into the last section, looking at these hep C meds and how they interact with non-antiretroviral medications. And this is our last case. This one's a, probably a little tougher. This is a 35-year-old female. She has HIV, is well-controlled on BICTAF FTC. She takes ethanyl estradiol and levonorgestrel and omeprazole for control of her Barrett's esophagus. And you are considering treating her hep C with either GP or soft fel. So which of the following interactions do you think would be most significant? Would you expect an increase in ethanyl estradiol levels, a decrease in sofosbuvir levels from the omeprazole, a decrease in glucoprevir levels from the omeprazole, or an increase in the ethanyl estradiol levels from the soft valve? Okay, got a bit of a distribution, so let's dive in and take a look at this. So my summary table here of significant interactions of DAAs and non-ARVs highlights the case where this interaction in this patient really stems from her oral contraceptive. And I think when we go back to John's presentation last week and we see this new sort of bimodal distribution of the epidemic with hep C is we're seeing a lot of younger individuals, not only younger, younger females with hep C, and this is actually a, a fairly common and significant interactions. And what can happen with the use of Maverit is it can increase those ethanyl estradiol levels, leading to some significant increase or impairment with the liver, leading to elevations in LFTs. So we generally want to avoid, monitor, look for secondary options for contraception. But if, if we kind of just go through top to bottom and look at the acid-reducing agents, Maverit's really fine with that. But it's the velpatosphere that if we go back to their, you know, some of the earlier slides, that it requires an acidic environment to absorb. So the more potent acid suppression we get, the more significant the interaction. So starting out with antacids, you generally want to separate the antacids by about four hours since that's about how long the antacids last. The histamine 2 receptor, receptor antagonists, they can raise the pH, you know, maybe up to three for six to 12 hours. So usually administering up to 40 milligrams of famotidine along with or separated by 12 hours from the Epclusa. And because the proton pump inhibitors are the most potent, it is not recommended to use with sofosbuvir velpatosphere due to the risk of decreasing the absorption of velpatosphere, leaving you kind of with sofosbuvir alone, increasing the risk of failing therapy. Now, there's a lot of use with amiodarone, but there can be significant bradycardia associated with an interaction between the Epclusa. 
And then when we look at the anticonvulsants and the antimicrobacterial drugs, these act the same by causing an induction in the metabolism. It sort of speeds it up, lowering the serum levels of both GP and Softvel. And any of those older anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, or if the patient is on really any of the rifamycins, it's, it's not recommended to use either of these agents. Statins are always notorious for interactions at the level of the liver, and similar to HIV interactions, we avoid lovastatin and simvastatin in a majority of patients living with HIV. It's just always tough to navigate some of those interactions, and they can be significant enough leading to rhabdo and just real significant adverse effects. But patients that do need the statin, certainly you can dose adjust, things like rosuvastatin, pravastatin, pitavastatin, and sometimes the, uh, the general clinical approach is just to hold the statin for 8 to 12 weeks while they are on the hep C treatment. And then St. John's wort, which always gets the bad name, should avoid that as well. So that's really all I have, and I'll go ahead and, and stop, but I'll certainly take any thoughts, questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.